Hey guys, it's Guinea Girl. So today's video is about prepping resin horses. Um, so this can also work a little bit for custom horses that have already been finished and are now being prepped. Um, so yeah, this can be used in quite a few ways. So first of all, um, this isn't really a full tutorial, but more of an explanation video similar to my how to make jump video you know, where I just talk through it because a lot of these things take a long time and I really don't have time to put it all on camera. Um, so yeah, so first of all what you're going to need is a horse that's ready to be prepped and painted. Um, so here I have a custom horse that I started on a while ago. Uh, she actually doesn't have hair yet, but um, let's just ignore that for now. She's just going to be used as an example. And then I have a traditional resin here. This is um, Phoenix. She is braided She's the braided variation. Um, so yeah, I recently bought her. I was really lucky because I bought her secondhand as they sold out a long time ago. Um, so yeah, I was really happy about that. Uh, yeah, so she's been a lot of work. She's been taking up a lot of my time as I've been going through and um, fixing small things here and there. So to start off, what you're going to really need. So if you're doing uh, dealing with resins, especially sometimes, if, especially if you buy them. Um, as like second castings or whatever. Um, they'll have like big seams or whatever and you can take your knife, exacto knife and scrape them off. If you have a carbide stra scraper, carbide scraper, yeah, um, you can also use that too. And then some sculpting tools and dentist tools have like little sharp hook things that can also be used really well for that. Um, and so once you have all the biggest, the biggest things off, um, you can sand off remaining little things that are still left over. So when I sand, I like to use the largest number of grit that I can find. Um, so this is 220. Um, so like, you do not want to use like anything below um, like 200. Like 200 up is generally my rule of thumb, but depending on your model, even 220 can be way too big. And if you use it, you'll get a bunch of fine little scratches all over the place, which is horrible. It's absolutely horrible to get out. So you'd be really careful about that. Um, so the finer the grit, the better. Um, when I'm really finishing up, I will seriously use the like 2000 grit sandpaper, which is used on finishing cars. Um, that works really well for me. Uh, same with like a 1700 or something. Um, because you have to keep in mind that's actually like how many chunks are on there. So if there's less chunks, they're obviously going to be bigger. And then you're going to get a bunch of sparsal scratches everywhere. So, um, yeah, you have to keep that in mind. Whereas when you're working on things such as um, plastic ponies, these will take a lot to sand up. If you're going to use my 2000 grit sandpaper, you're going to be sanding for five days straight and not get anywhere. So I will actually use these really thick grits on them. Um, you got to be careful if you have a layer of primer or something over them that's actually softer. But if you're just going on straight plastic, then go ahead and sand like crazy. Um, and then you can go back and kind of finish everything up with a, a larger grit sandpaper. And so um, that's how I deal with most of my removal processes. Now when you have small divots or lumpy parts or whatever that you want to fill in, um, you can see there's a lot of dark spots all over her where I kind of went in and smoothed out spots. Um, you can see a lot of these are in between muscles. Notice I not just fill it in so she doesn't have a muscle, but a lot of the indentations were actually really rough. So I went back in and I actually made another indentation so there's still a definite line in the muscle. So don't just fill in muscles. Because I know that's kind of what it looks like I did. So for the clay I use, I use epoxy sculpt. Um, this is a two-part sculpt, so there's part A and part B. I prefer to use white just because it matches the color of my primer. Um, natural is also good. I have a couple things of that. This is just the part B. Uh, this is an older one, but yeah, it's natural. It's uh, just like a grayish color. You can kind of see, yeah. And so... Um, just to keep these lasting a little bit longer, a, trip, a trick I learned um, from a couple of friends is to put um, like a wet towel or something in there and then that will keep it moist and lasting a long time. Um, just because I don't really sculpt that often, so when I finally do get out to sculpt, I usually use a lot and then there's like nothing left because it's all dried out. So just be careful and always put the lids back on because they will um, they'll lose all their moisture really quickly. 
Um, so yeah, I basically just go in and I mix two parts together make sure it's 50-50 so you don't have like way more of one than the other. And then see, so generally I use usually roll out little like snake things and I'll put them in the spot I need them and I'll smush them out. And then I use just like a little plastic cup of water and then I'll smooth it out. I know some people use rubbing alcohol, um, but I actually had some problems with that earlier where it was bubbling. Uh, my clay was getting little holes all over it and it was just absolutely horrible. I don't know if it's my rubbing alcohol specifically or if it was just, it doesn't work right. I don't know what it was, but it was horrible. Um, and it took me forever to realize that it was because I was, uh, I had to switch back to water. I still don't know what it was. I mean, I know people who use it and they have amazing results, but I just honestly don't know what was going on with mine. Maybe it was just something was up with my clay batch, something was up with my rubbing alcohol, I don't really know. Um... But I, I don't, I've never heard of it before, but just to be cautious of it, I guess. Um, I mean, I honestly feel like water works just the same. And if you're really that desperate for some sort of liquid, this stuff is non-toxic. Of course, it tastes like crap, but if you really need it, you can use saliva too. Um, but, yeah, so I also use a ton of sculpting tools. Um, I mean, the, most of these are just for um, my customs, but... When I'm going in the muscle and stuff, um, generally, sometimes, especially in hard to reach areas, your hand isn't enough, so I got different things, like I got, like, thicker dowels, um, and then I got, like, thinner toothpicks, and I've just got a ton of things. Um, what you're really looking for when you do this is rounder things like this, it's a round tip at the end, and then you can go in there and just, like, um, smooth it out how you need. Uh, the back of uh, paintbrushes work really well, too. Um, and so after I do that, I'll generally go in and smooth it out. Um, that's mostly for bigger things, though, where I'm smoothing out a really large chunk. Uh, and then you can see that I had to add a little touch-ups to her braids because there were, like, air bubbles in, like, all of the braids, which was kind of annoying, but, I mean, it's obviously expected to have, uh, casted things that aren't prepped yet. So what I would do is I would take a little tiny bead of clay, make sure it's mixed 50-50 or else it won't harden, and then I will put it like in the hole and then I will take like a really fine point and I'll braid or I'll sculpt back in the braid marks so it all fits out. And um, so how I was mentioning before where you just put the snake down of clay and then you smooth it out with the back of a paintbrush or something that's kind of thick and then you go in with your hand in the water and you smooth it. You can do the same process for the face. I did that here a lot. Um, and in the neck. So it works in a lot of places. Now for like the smallest things, like filling in a tiny little hole that you can't get clay to fit in, I will actually use wood glue and I'll just leave a bead of it in the spot I need it. Uh, some people also use paint, but I generally find it doesn't um, stick as well as glue because this is actually meant as like holding stuff together, like really heavy duty stuff. So it actually holds really well and it stays there. It doesn't really chip or anything. So um, that works really well also instead of trying to fit a tiny little bead of clay in there. Um, because like my horse, she has a bit of like a notch in her nose. You can see there's a little bit of clay in there. Um, so yeah, I had to fill it in and it was a pain. So I probably should have used wood glue like I do currently. Um, so yeah, I think this pretty much most of it. Um, and then after you're all done, you can take uh, primer. I use Krylon, but I mean, similar things will work, and you can just spray your horse with white uh, spray paint. Uh, I'm sorry, don't use regular spray paint. Use spray primer. Yeah, I don't like to use paint on primers with a brush because they tend to uh, leave brush strokes, but spray on primers are great. A lot of people who are doing darker colors like bays and chestnuts tend to use a red primer and that works really well too. Uh, if you're working on a darker gray or whatever, you can use gray primer um, so on. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be doing either um, like a moosey gray, like a solid gray, um, like a Grola or something or I'm going to be doing a dapple gray. I'm not really 100% what I'm doing yet, so you should tell me what color to make her in the comments. Dapple gray or Grola, what do you think? Um, so yeah, that will be a lot of fun. And then I've got this little classic Arabian that I got in progress too. So yeah, they're both works in progress. Don't even know when I'm gonna finish them. 
And then of course I've got that one guy that I've had forever and I started pastelling him but then I realized uh, I don't like him, he's a lot of lumps, let's start over. So I started sanding again and so he's in progress again. So he's been in progress for well over two years now, we'll see where this is taking me. Um, but I really like prepping because even though it is so, it takes forever and sometimes you feel like you're never going to finish, you can basically choose how much work you want to put into it. If you want to get the best results possible, take every second and go over and over again and again and that is like the only way to guarantee it. Um, because I've seen some beautifully painted models but they weren't prepped correctly, where they had little pinholes, they had all sorts of just small issues, they had rough spots, and even though the paint I guess kind of made up for it in a way, it still kind of ruined the model to me. So just really take your time when going over things. Um, that's really the only way to do it. Um, and I know some people use, I don't know exactly what the mix is called, I know meso is half of it. I don't know. And yeah, I think it's meso and model, or no. Oh my goodness, I don't even know. Maybe it's like gesso and modeling paste and they call it meso or something. I don't know exactly what the combination is, but they'll mix like a, I'm, I believe it's a modeling paste with something called gesso. And then they call it gesso after they mix it. I don't know. Yeah, I've never used it before, but I've heard it does good things. I'm sorry, I totally can't remember what the word combination was. But, um, yeah, so I'll have to double check that, and I will post it in the comments or description or something. So, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. But anyways, um, I hope you guys have a fun time prepping models, even though sometimes it really sucks. So, yeah, comment, rate, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let me know if this video helped you or not. I know I don't really do a lot of customizing stuff because I'm not really a customizer, but uh, I figured I might as well share a little something here and there. So anyways, thanks for watching so much, guys. Bye!